Well, good morning. It's already uh, 8.11. I've been sitting here at the computer waiting for, for Screencast-O-Matic to boot up. It took a long time for it to do so this morning, but it's finally here. Uh, but it's um, Thursday morning, the first day of June 2017. Uh, should be differential equations, Math 238. However, I'm the only person in the room. Uh, so I'm going to go and get started from where we left off last time. Wish you were here. Hopefully people will be coming in. Uh, but so far, I'm the only one. So let's pick up where we were last time. If I can get the slide to come up, and there it is. Sort of. It's flashed up a time or two, and now it's signaling me to continue waiting. So I am waiting. And let's get my pen color selected. Okay, last time we ended on talking about what the normal form um, of a differential equation is. And that's when the highest uh, degree, the highest, that's not quite the right word for it, the highest derivative in the differential equation is isolated on one side of the equal sign and everything else on the other side, okay? And uh, we just had talked about that uh, in example, uh, you know, on the top half of page five, that's where the definition was. Example three, on the lower half, the lower part, or right at midway down page five, that's where we're going to actually do these. Pretty simple concept to show. Uh, here's the a first order differential equation. 4x dy dx plus y equal x. Okay? Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that writing it in this way. In fact, in a certain type of um, situation, that's exactly the form we're going to want it in, okay? Precisely the form we'll want it in. Uh, however, that's not what we call the normal form. The normal form would find the highest derivative, the only derivative is this one, and isolate it, get everything else on the other side. So that's simply subtract y from both sides. And that would give you 4x dy dx is equal to x minus y. Still not isolated, so still wanting to isolate this, so we'll divide both sides by 4x. Okay, these go out and you get dy dx is equal to y, x minus y over 4x. Okay, and that is normal form for that original differential equation. Now, there's nothing all that special about the normal form in most circumstances. However, one of the first things we're going to do is look at, uh, at least for first order differential equations, we're going to look at slopes. dy dx gives the slope of the tangent line of whatever function you're dealing with. There's a formula for it. So if you wanted to determine the slope at any point in the coordinate plane. Pick an x-y point, and here we have a student. Fantastic. Megan's here. Okay. Let me the projector turned on. I'm talking to myself. I don't need to project. Uh, let me also get light. So that may be easier to see, but you can read those at the same time. coming up slowly, but it's going to appear in a second or two. Uh, first, I want to ask any questions for anything we've covered so far. Um, What's that? Okay. So what we talked about at the end of the last class was getting a differential equation into normal form. And what the normal form is is find the highest derivative in that differential equation, 
isolate that on the left and everything else on the right. And that's what we did to this one. And I mentioned before, there will be some procedures we'll use very soon that that's precisely the form we're going to want to use to solve the differential equation. So normal form is nothing super special. Now for first order differentials, that's what I was just talking about when you came in, when you get it in this form, basically this says slope of tangent line. That's what the first derivative is. So you can plug in any point on the coordinate plane. Preferably have the computer do this, but you can do it yourself. Pick a point on the coordinate plane. Any point. Negative 1, 3. So x is negative 1, y is 3, the numerator will be negative 4, and this will be a minus 4 down here, the slope there will be 1. So at negative 1, 3, negative 1, 3, the slope is 1. You can do that for every point on here, and what you have is then an indicator of the drift, you might say, of this differential equation. And I think we're about to double our class size. We are. Okay. My faithful two are here. We have still have seen Reginald T. Harris, who wasn't on the original role last week, but he showed up Friday when I was doing attendance. Showed up on the roll. Still haven't seen him in person. Okay. You'll need to listen to what we've done already. I've repeated it twice now. It's just finding... The normal form for a differential equation. That was the one given. The normal form is find the highest derivative in the equation. This is first order, so it's dy dx. Isolate that, get everything else on the other side. And I was just talking about later, very soon, we're going to use that form right there. We don't want it in normal form to use as part of our solution for the differential equation. But before then, we're going to especially with first order derivatives, that tells you the slope of the tangent line, and as we were just talking about, you can pick any point on the coordinate grid there. Any point. Make a point, pick negative one, three. Okay? Find that point there, plug in negative one here, minus three, that would be minus four over, minus four is a positive one. At that point, negative one, three, the slope you know is plus one. You can do that for every point on the grid, and guess what you get? Well, uh, every point, you cannot put an x equals zero anywhere. Okay? So basically, x equals zero, where is that? On your coordinate. Okay, the origin certainly is one place where x is equal to zero. Is that the only place? That's, that's where y is equal to zero. That's where x is equal to zero. Yeah, the vertical line, the, the vertical axis, y axis in this case, that would be so. There we know, even though at negative 1, 3, we have a slope of 1, you're not because at x equals zero, undefined. Absolutely undefined. Okay. And... What you can tell about that undefinedness is that when x is equal to 0, this comes out being a negative y up here. Uh, I think the book goofed something here. Do you, know, oh, you don't have a book yet. You see anything wrong in the book? <laughs> Page 5, example 3b. In the original thing, they have a plus 6. In the answer, they have a minus 6y. Where did that y come from? No clue, okay? So one of those is incorrect. I don't know which one. All right. So, so far, all we've been doing is classifying by order, okay? Well, no, first we're classified by type. All we're dealing with is ordinary differential equations, not partials. Then we classified by order, first order, second order. Got that. Now we're moving to classification by linearity. 
Okay. Now, what do we mean by that? Let's go back to our original form. That was ex uh, equation four. You got to find it somewhere here. Yeah, there it is, up on the page. Um, I'll write it down again. Uh, if you have f of x, y, y prime, I think is how they put it, yeah, uh, dot, 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 all the way up to y to the n minus, no, y to the n. No, okay. It's not y to the n. The nth derivative of y, that's the way to say that, okay, is equal to zero. Now, you can write any differential equation in that form. That one was written in that form, okay? This one wasn't, but if you subtracted the x from both sides, this would be, what would be on the left would be your capital F function. That right there is your capital F function. When it's equal to zero, that's what you get, okay? Now, that's how you can write any differential equation. Now, what do we mean by linearity? Okay, it's linear if that function f is linear in everything to do with y. Okay, this y is only to the first power. The first derivative of y is only to the first power. The second derivative of y is only to the first power. And every derivative of y is only to the first power. x can be any power you want. It can be exponential, it can be a trig function, it can be anything. But these, the y's, anything to do with y, y and all its derivatives are only to the first power. That would be a linear differential equation. Okay? So that's what we mean by a linear differential equation. Okay. Um, they write down a couple of other forms of this, which I, uh, I can't see why it's all that more instructive, but it's fine. Let me write it down in its most general form, okay? Big and wordy. In fact, I think I'll go to a clean page to do so, okay? If it was right, there it goes. All right. A sub n of x. Now, what is that? That's a coefficient function. Your coefficients of your y terms can have x dependencies at any power, any kind of function, any way you want to do it. It's some function of x. That's your coefficient function. And that's times d to the nth y dx to the nth which means the nth derivative of y with respect to x, plus a sub n minus 1. And that's also a function of x, not of y, of x, okay? Strictly a function of x. It could be a constant, that's fine, but it just can't have any y's in it, any form of a y in it, okay? And then d n minus 1, well, um, you don't need the parentheses here if you're doing... Um, prime notation you would so let me take out that parentheses it's not wrong to put it there but it's just not necessary dx wait, d to the n y leave that in there I can't write n minus 1 okay that's the next lower derivative plus some a to n minus 2 as a function of x and x alone d to the n minus 2 y over dx to the n minus 2 this, this is Leibniz notation it takes a long time to write plus dot 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 down to plus a sub 2 as a function of x d2 y dx squared plus a sub 1 as a function of x, dy dx, 
plus a sub 0 of x. That's a function of x as well, and that can be times y. And that's equal to some g of x. Now that's the most generic form of a linear first order, I mean, linear nth order differential equation, ordinary differential equation. Okay? Now, remember I said each of these has to be to the first power. I mean, it's the nth derivative, but it's not nth derivative squared or cubed or to the three half power, one half power, or anything else. It's to the first power. And that's to the first power. And that's to the first power. Now, what I did also mention, but this is required for it to be linear, these coefficients cannot have any y dependence or y prime dependence or y double prime dependence. In other words, these are functions of x and x alone. So you couldn't have uh, d2y dx squared and a y both in the same term because then it would be linear anymore. The only y presence is in a derivative of y or the function y itself. And on the left-hand side, everything has each of those to the first power, no cross products, no products of any y's, each of those, and the, the coefficients could have x dependence. On the right-hand side, you can have any other function of x. x to the 4 million fifth, you know, thirds, you know, or something. You know, it doesn't matter, just some function of x. I don't want to solve that one, but, you know, it could be there. That's what we mean by linearity. Okay, now let's look at, or they're going to have us look at two special cases of that equation. Okay, uh, we'll look at linear first order equations, linear first order equations, and linear second order equations. Okay, so the first order would then just be a, a1. I'm writing, but it's not showing up. Okay, oh, there it is. A1 of x dy dx plus, come on, right. Boy, this thing is dragging today. Well, plus A0 of x y is equal to g of x. Okay, it's slow, but it's there. Okay, it's a linear because each of these is to the first power, no cross terms, first order ordinary differential equation. Okay, now if you think about it, remember the first example in three, three a. That was a linear first order differential equation. We weren't talking about linearity there, but it was. Okay? Look just above you there, and that is exactly that form. Okay? Second order linear ordinary differential equation would start with a, a sub 2x d2y dx squared plus a sub 1 x as a function of x, dy dx plus some a sub 0 of x, y equals some g of x. <coughs> okay, that's a linear because each of the terms that have anything to do with y, the function itself, first derivative, second derivative, all the derivatives of y, that's the only term in only factor in that term that has any y in it, okay? <coughs> the coefficients can't have a y in it or any derivative of y in it. It's strictly x's, okay? And the constant the n, strictly x. If you look at 3b, that was a linear second order ordinary differential equation. It was a real simple one, the x of x was 1, the a sub y, I think, was 1. I mean, a sub 1 
I believe was one, two, no, a minus one, okay? Uh, <laughs> and depends on uh, which one you looked at. If you looked at their second answer, that would have been a six wide. So six is a function of x, just doesn't have any x dependence or constant. But without the y there, that would have been here. So yeah, that would have been a linear uh, second order ordinary differential equation. Okay. Now the additive combination on the left hand side of this one, okay, uh, we see the characteristic two properties of linear ordinary differential equations are as follows. The dependent variable y and each of its derivatives, y prime, y double prime, y triple prime, up to y to the nth, I'm sorry, went to that point, the top one, not this one, this, okay, not this one, okay, um, are of first degree, in other words, not all are squared or cubed or square roots or, or any other power other than one, uh, that is the power of each term is precisely one, that has anything to do with y. The coefficients a0, a1, a2, up to an of the y, y prime, y double prime depend at most on the independent variable x. They could be constants and have no x dependence either, but they can't have any y dependence at all. In other words, no y's, no y primes, no anything to do with y in those coefficients. Okay, what I've been saying, they're reiterating. Now, what in the world would be a nonlinear ordinary differential equation? It's one that's not linear. In other words, at least one of those terms has either a y or a y derivative, a derivative of y, to some power other than one, or it has as the coefficient of that uh, derivative of y you know, term, you have some y or y other derivative of y in the coefficient as well. In other words, you could have a y in that coefficient. Or you could have this one multiplied by d2y dx. Anything that has more than one factor that has anything to do with y in it, whether they're to a power other than one or multiplied by something with a y in it at any power, that would be nonlinear. Okay. So let's look at example four. I think you'll find this is hopefully pretty easy to do. If I can get the pen to operate, there we go. All right. Let's look at this y minus x dx plus 4x dy is equal to 0. All right. Now, do you think that's linear or not? Why do you say linear? First, you need to write that in a derivative state rather than a differential. You don't have to. If you can see it without, it's fine. But I find it easier, too. So the first thing we're going to do, and we did this last time, and this is not really what you're doing, but it is what it seems like you're doing. It's like you're dividing each term by dx. Okay, let's rewrite that then. Here, these go out, and you have y minus x plus 4x dy dx is equal to 0. Okay? Now, if you write that in descending derivative form, that would be 4x dy dx plus y, and then add and bring the x to the other side is equal to x. Right? You're absolutely right. That's linear. Okay, this coefficient of the x only, that coefficient 
constant, so we can do it. And on the right hand side is x only. So yes, that is a linear. It might not look like it here, but you see this y is not multiplied. If there had been a y in this one, you can't separate those. But with the dx, you could. So if you looked at that and said, yeah, that's separable tonight. I want to use that term. Uh, hope you don't use that term for something else. But it can be written as a uh, linear equation. Okay, how about this one? y double prime minus 2y plus y is equal to 0. Strange way to write it, but is that linear? Yes, it is. Now, that's a really bizarre way to write it. I wonder if they left off a y prime on that second term, but they didn't have it there. I would write this as y double prime minus y equals 0. Sure enough, coefficient here is a 1. That's not a function of y. Coefficient here is a minus 1. That's not a coefficient, not a function of y. And the right-hand side is not a function of y. Okay, so yeah. Linear. All right. How about this one? Boy, this takes a lot more to write. X cubed, d3y dx cubed, plus x dy dx minus 5y is equal to e to the x. Is that a linear, ordinary, differential equation? Yes, it is. Okay? Because the coefficient here is a function of x alone. The coefficient of this is a function of x alone. The coefficient of this is constant. And on the right hand side, it's all a function. There will come a time, and it's not really all that important, I don't even know why they do it, they'll say this is linear in y, but not linear in x. Who cares whether it's linear in x? Because this is x cubed, and frankly, I'm not sure if e to the x classifies as linear in x. It may, I don't know. But who cares about that? But that is indeed linear in y. Okay. This one was a first order linear differential equation. The second was a second order. This one's a third order linear ordinary differential equations. Okay, let's look at a few more. Let's go to a clean page because I think we're running out of room. Okay. 1 minus y times y prime plus 2y is equal to e to the x. They like that e to the x, don't they? Is that linear? No, why not? Okay. The coefficient for that, the first derivative of y, y prime here, coefficient is a function of y, not of x alone. And there's no way you can get rid of that. The closest you could do is try to divide this by 1 minus y, and that would be okay there. But then you would have a function of y over there. So you can't get rid of it. That is nonlinear. Okay? Nonlinear. How about this one? A first order nonlinear. Here's another one d2y dx squared plus sine y equals 0. Is that linear in y? How 
Uh, all right. This term certainly is coefficient one. Okay. This is a function of y. It's not y itself. If that was sine x y, in other words, uh, x, a y times sine x, then that would be the coefficient would be a function of y, but it's multiplied by the variable y alone, not a function of y. So no, uh, sine is not a linear function. Only something to the first power is a linear function. Sine is not. Okay. Right hand side looks wet there either. It's a constant. So that sine y prevents that from being a linear function. Okay? And let's see one more. d4y dx to the fourth plus y squared equals zero. Is that a linear function? And why? Why not? Because your y is squared. This is okay. No problem there. Coefficient is a constant one. Coefficient is a constant one here too, but y is not a, a to the first power. Y is to the second power there. And you see sine y there, that's not first power. I mean, y is to the first power, but it's not a linear term in y. It's a sine term in y. Okay. All right. Now, Back on page two, one of the goals in this course is to solve or find solutions of differential equations. That's what it's all about. In the next definition, we consider the concept of a solution of an ordinary differential equation. So here's a definition. I think since I'll be writing it out, and my writing is sloppy. I admit to that ahead of time, um, and I abbreviate like crazy. But here's a definition. Uh, I really hate this setup. I'm left-handed, and I have to read across here because I don't have room to put the book here because this cord is so short, okay? So it's painful, okay? Any function, phi, defined on an interval i, and possessing at least n derivatives okay, n derivatives that are continuous on i okay which, when substituted, again, I'm abbreviating like crazy, into an nth order ordinary differential equation, uh, uh, I mess it up. Remember I said DE was going to be differential equation. I started writing it. So differential equation. Reduces the equation to an identity. Okay. That said to be a solution of that differential equation on that interval of the equation on that interval. Okay. Lots, <laughs> lots of words here. Okay. Some function phi. You're given a function phi. Most of the time you're finding the function phi. But to start with, you're going to be given a function 
it needs to be defined on a given interval, i. In other words, if this was 1 over x minus 2, okay, you know what that looks like, don't you? Uh, our class we took at 2, and it's going to be something like this, you know. You can't have the interval from 0 to 4, because that's not defined at x equal 2. So it has to be a function phi that's defined on an interval i, meaning it has values on everywhere on that interval, okay? And it has to possess at least n derivatives, okay? So you can take the first derivative of that, the second derivative of that, and the third derivative of that, up to the nth derivative. And every one of those derivatives must be not only uh, defined there, but continuous on that i. So in other words, if you had a first derivative that went to infinity, somewhere on the interval, that wouldn't work, okay? So it has to have, this function phi has to be defined on that interval and have n derivatives that are continuous on that interval, okay? Which, if you take this function here and substitute it into an nth order, ordinary differential equation, in other words, you take those n derivatives, they're all continuous on that interval, and you plug it in to that nth order differential equation, all those derivatives of this, where they belong, it reduces that equation to an identity. 7 equals 7, 0 equals 0. You know, something that, that's obviously the same on both sides. Okay? Uh, then we say that is the solution of the equation on that interval. Ah. Now, notice what we a very important, very small word here. A solution. It doesn't mean it's the only solution. A differential equation may have, in fact, quite often will have multiple solutions. And we'll be doing that throughout the course of the day. But this one would be one of the solutions, a solution of that equation on that other. So that's the definition. Okay? Uh, in other words, a solution of an nth order ordinary differential equation, uh, and we'll go back to the one we had written up there before, that big old long thing. Um, a solution of that is some function phi that possesses at least n derivatives for which, when you plug those n derivatives in there, then it's equal to what we started with. Now, that function we're referring to is that one that said f of uh, x, y, y prime, dot, 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 all the way up to y, the nth derivative of y is equal to zero. Okay, that's the equation. Okay, so that means if this phi is a solution for that, then f of x, okay, it doesn't matter what the x is, uh, phi of x, phi prime of x, dot, 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 all the way up to and including phi, phi, the nth derivative of phi of x, is equal to zero. It solves that equation. If you plug in the phi for the y, take all its derivatives and stuff, then and plug it in, that's going to be an identity. You'll wind up with zero on this side to match the zero on that side. Okay. For all the x's in the interval in question. It can't be just for some of them, for all of them. That's what makes it an identity. Okay. We say that phi satisfies a differential equation on i, and for our purposes, we'll assume that the solution phi is a real valued function. We'll assume there's no complex numbers in, incorporated in it. Don't think that's absolutely necessary, but for this course, we'll, we'll make that assumption. In our introductory discussion, we saw that, remember, y is equal to e to the point one x squared is a solution for differential equation, and that's on the interval minus infinity to infinity. 
won't go back and do that again, but it was, that was your fee that worked, okay? Or the Y, you don't have to call it fee. So, let's think about that interval uh, of the definition. You cannot think solution of an ordinary differential equation without simultaneously thinking interval. The interval could be all real numbers, like that, the one they were just talking about was, or it could be limited because either the function is not defined everywhere or its derivatives are not defined everywhere, okay? Uh, the interval in that definition is called the interval of definition, interval of existence, the interval of validity, the domain of the solution, all those mean the same thing. Uh, and can be an open interval, A to B, or a closed interval, A to B, or an infinite interval, A to infinity, minus infinity to infinity, uh, infinity, uh, minus infinity to B, it can be any of those. So let's look at example five and see if we can make this definition make some sense. Bring reality into the picture here. Okay. Verify that the indicated function is a solution of the given differential equation on the interval minus infinity to infinity. Here it is. dy dx, this is the differential equation, is equal to x y to the one half. Okay? Here is a function they're suggesting or asking is this a solution? y is equal to 1 16th x to the fourth. Weird type of thing. Is that true? How do you verify if that's true or not? Say again? Okay. Substitute? Is that what you said? I think I know what you mean by that. Okay. That's a Y. Here we'll ask for a derivative of Y, so we've got to take that. Okay. But we're also asked for the square root of Y. So we've got to take that as well. So let's do those things first, and then put those things in here, and see if we get an identity or not. Okay. So, what's the first thing I said? Doesn't matter. Either one of them. Say again? Find the derivative. Always a good answer, isn't it? Okay. dy dx is equal to what? Say again? 1 over? Say again? 1 over 16? Okay. Say again. Okay. Isn't it 4x to the third? When you take the root of it, I was doing what you told me to. And since you pulled out the 1 over 16, fine, do that. Then you take the derivative of x to the fourth, and that would be 4 times x to the fifth. I asked exactly how I would have, but y'all said 1 over 16, so I wrote it. So this is the same as 1 over 4 x cubed. Got it? What else do we have to do? Figure about what y to the one half is. And what would that be? The square root of 1 over 16 x fourth, right? And what would that be? A little louder, I can't hear. Well, it's the square root of 1 16th. Well, what's the square root of 1? Okay, square root of 16. 4. Okay, square root of x to the fourth. X squared. See, you knew it. 
Okay? Now, let's plug in these things over here. Is that what you meant by substituting? I thought that's what you meant. Okay? So this thing, dy dx, is 1 fourth x cubed. The question is, is that equal to x times the square root of x, which would be 1 fourth x squared? And what do you think? Yes, of course it is. Those are the same, an identity, we got it not. So, we verified that is a solution, it may not be the only solution, of that differential equation. See it? Okay. Let me clean the page if you got it. You got it? Okay. Let's do the B one. Y double prime, thank you for using prime notation, minus 2Y prime plus Y equals 0. Okay? It's suggesting here, or asking us to show, that Y is equal to X e to the X, that that is indeed a solution for that differential equation. What are we going to need to do first? Second day? Take a derivative. Why not? Let's do it. We need it there. Y prime is equal to, oh boy, what is Y prime equal to? Looks like a product rule to me, doesn't it? What would that give us? A little louder. E to the X will be one term. Second. Okay. All right. Both of those are correct. <laughs> it depends on what you're doing. Okay. A product rule, you got two functions there. Let's call it f and g. This is f, that's g. So it's either f times the derivative of g plus g times the derivative of f. Okay. Now, which were you doing? I, it doesn't matter which one you do first. And you said e to the x, you take the derivative of x times e to the x. Yeah, that's right. Then you have a plus x e to the x. You got it. Okay? What else do we need to do? Take a second derivative. y double prime is going to be what? I don't know why. Okay. I think I can do the first one. What is it? E to the X. And one of my favorites. Plus, and you got to take a derivative of that. But we just took a derivative of that, wasn't, didn't we? And we found that to be E to the X plus X E to the X, right? So this comes out being 2 E to the X plus X E to the X. Phew, I'm getting tired of writing that. Okay. Now we plug and chug and see if we got it. So there's our y double prime, 2e to the x plus xe to the x, right? Minus 2 times y prime, e to the x plus xe to the x, right? Plus y, which was x e to the x. The question is, is that equal to zero? If it is, we're made in the shade, okay? If not, that wasn't a solution, or we made a mistake. So let's see what we got. 2e to the x plus xe to the x minus 2e two, two to the x minus 2xe to the x this thing is driving me nuts. Plus x e to the x, is that equal to zero? Well, let's see. Here's a 2 e to the x, there's a minus 2 e to the x. Those sure enough add to zero. Here's an x e to the x, another x e to the e to the x, that's 2 x e to the x, minus 2 x e to the e to the x. Those add to zero, sure enough we get an identity zero is equal to zero. 
that is a solution. All right. See how these work? You got to do everything it says, plug them in, see if it works. All right. Now, note two that each differential equation in example five, I already erased one, sorry about that, also has uh, a constant solution. Now, I've erased the other one, but this one's still there. Here's another one. Try this one on the side. Y is equal to zero. Y is equal to zero. That's a that, that's an equation, a function, right? What's the first derivative of that? Zero. What's the second derivative of that? Zero. Then you have zero minus two times zero plus zero. Is that equal to zero? Yes, it is. So that's called the trivial solution. Now, not all of them will do that, but both of these will. And uh, it's probably not really obvious why the first one will, but let's try it. Let me go back and write again. dy dx is equal to x y to the one half. The suggestion here at y equals zero could also be a solution. Is it? Okay. Well, what's the derivative of y? Zero. So this would be zero. Is that equal to x? That what's the derivative? The square root of zero. Zero, okay? So zero is equal to x times zero. Yep. Oops. Another solution. Now, not always will x at y equals zero be a solution, but quite often it will be. And if it is, that's called a trivial solution. But it is a solution. Now, oh, I'm having trouble breathing. <clears throat> The graph of phi of an ordinary different, differential equation is called a solution curve, okay? Since phi is a differentiable function, it is continuous on its interval i of, dif, of definition, and thus there may be differences, may be a difference between the graph of function phi and the graph of the solution phi. Put another way, the domain of the function phi need not be the same as the interval i of definition or domain. Uh, and example six will sort of illustrate that. Doesn't sound like a lot of fun, does it? But let's see what it does. Let's clear the ink here. Have y'all got it? Okay. So, we're going to start with this. What is the domain of this function? Y is equal to 1 over x. What's the domain of that function? Take a yeah. What yeah? What is the domain of that function? Is the values for x that you are allowed? Take a non-zero. You got it. All real numbers x as long as x is not equal to zero. As long as that's true. You can have all the negative numbers, all the positive numbers. The domain is everything except zero. Very good. Okay. Now that is, the domain of that, considered simply as a function, set of all real numbers, x except zero. Okay, when you graph it, uh, you don't have a book. Let me show you. It, oh, you do. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, I was thinking you didn't. Okay, I was just looking. Okay, you see the graph of it there, right? Okay, fantastic. I don't have to write it. And that's right. write the other stuff, did I? Okay, now, uh, we plot all the points of XY plane, and you get those first quadrant, third quadrant, the curves there, the hyperbola there. Uh, that's your graph. All real numbers except X equals zero. The rational function, y is equal to 1 over x, is discontinuous at 0, and its graph in the neighborhood of the origin is given uh, oh, in that first figure, 8. Okay. 
the function 1 over x is not differentiable at x equals 0 because it's not defined at x equals 0. So therefore, uh, that's a vertical, you know, the y-axis is a vertical asymptote. So y is equal to 1 over x is a function defined everywhere except x equals 0. But if y is equal to 1 over x is a solution of a linear first order differential equation, and let's see if it is. Um, okay. Here's the linear first order differential equation. XY prime plus Y equals zero. Okay. It's suggesting Y is equal to one over X is a solution there. Let's verify that. Now. If I'm going to take a derivative of y, I want to rewrite this y. Anyone want to hazard a guess as how I'd like to rewrite it? Well, before, rewriting y, I would write it at x to the minus 1. I like taking that derivative better than I do the other. I mean, the quotient rule is fun, but if I can avoid it, I will. Okay, I will prefer doing a power rule. That's so easy. So writing it that way, what is your y prime? Yeah, I think what you're saying is find y prime. What is your y prime then? Negative. X to the negative 2. And then we can rewrite it if we wanted to as minus 1 over x squared. I don't know if you want to or not, but that's, that's perfectly legal to do that. Okay? Now, this is also defined everywhere except x equals to 0. Okay? So that can be a solution only on an interval that does not contain 0. It cannot be a solution from not minus 1 to 1. That contains 0. It cannot be a solution that's from 0 to 7 if the 0 is in a bracket. Can't be. But from 1 to 7, fine. Open interval 0 to 7, fine. You know, uh, 7 to infinity. Mm -hmm. Open interval 0 to infinity, fine. Negative infinity to 0, open, you know, bracket, open parentheses, fine. But it can't include 0. It can't be negative 3 to, to 5. No, it is not a solution on that interval. Okay? Um, oh, we never did, wait, sorry, we never did verify it, did we? Let's plug it in. That would be x times y prime, which is minus 1 over x squared, right? Plus y, which is 1 over x. The question is, is that equal to 0? There's our question, right? Is it true? This x will cancel out one of those x's, right? Divide it out. And then you have minus 1 over x plus 1 over x. Sure enough, that is equal to 0. Bingo. Uh, oops, can't say that in Alabama. Okay. Now, got a question for you. Is y equals 0 a solution for this? Is the trivial solution a solution to this differential equation? It would almost seem like it was, wouldn't it? y is equal to 0. Uh, y prime would be equal to 0. 0 plus 0 is equal to 0. So it sure does look like y equals 0 is... But guess what? Y equals zero never occurs in this one. But that's okay. Because you see, Y can never be zero because one is never zero. Okay? So that is another solution. The trivial solution is a solution to differential equation, but it has nothing in common with that solution. Okay? The book doesn't do that, but I, I don't think it does. All right.
but this function is defined everywhere except zero. The solution to your differential equation, which is that function, is only defined on intervals that don't include zero. So you can't say from all real numbers except x equals zero, it has to be an interval that doesn't contain that. So it can be any th interval on the left of zero, any interval on the right of zero, it just can't contain zero. So just because the function has a domain that may not be the same as the domain of your or your interval of the uh, solution. Okay. I think we beat that to death, didn't we? Okay. Um, the next thing we're going to do is look at explicit and implicit solutions. Now, well, you did this in Cal 1, I'm pretty sure, didn't you? I can't remember if we did it in, in Cal 2 or not. But Cal 1, yeah, we did this. Um, in, from your study in Cal, in, in perhaps in Cal 3, I think we did too. A solution in which the dependent variable is expressed solely in terms of the independent variable and constants is said to be an explicit solution. Okay? For instance, that is an explicit solution. Y is equal to 1 over X. That's solely in terms of X and constants. Okay? But, if you have Y is equal to something and you had any Ys in there at all that you couldn't separate out and get rid of, then that would be an implicit solution, okay? So if you can't express it strictly in terms of x's and constants, it's an explicit solution. If, by chance, you can't separate them all, then it's an implicit solution. We'll see an example of it a little bit later, okay? For our purposes, let us think of explicit solution as the explicit formula y is equal to phi of x, okay? what we were doing before. That's a function of x, x and x alone. We can manipulate, evaluate, differentiate using standard rules. Okay? So, ones we've used. 1 16th x fourth, explicit. x e to the x, explicit. 1 over x, explicit. Okay? y is equal to zero, explicit. You know, the trivial solution. Okay? Um, when we get down to the business of actually solving some ordinary differential equations, you will see that methods of solution do not always lead to explicit solutions y is equal to some phi of x. This is particularly true when we attempt to solve nonlinear first order differential equations. Often we have to be content with some expression g of xy is equal to zero, not just some uh, phi of x, we have to have an x and a y in there. So here's another definition. You got this on your phone? Okay. I'll not write it then. Well, I don't know if this other guy's going to show up or not, but he can listen to me. A relation g of xy equals zero is said to be an implicit solution of an ordinary differential equation then you can go back to that big, long, hairy thing we had at the beginning, the capital F of all those things, okay? Uh, on an interval I, provided that there exists at least one function, phi, that satisfies the relation as well as the differential equation. Now, they said phi. Usually, they reserve phi to be a function of x alone, okay? It is beyond the scope of this course to investigate the conditions under which that function g of x, y equals zero defines a differentiable function phi, so we're not going to do it. Okay, so we shall assume that if the formal implementation of the method of solution leads to this relationship, uh, then there exists at least one function phi that satisfies both the uh, relation that is g of x, v of x equals zero, and the differential equation uh, on the interval i. 
if the implicit solution is fairly simple, g of x, y is fairly simple, we may be able to solve for uh, y in terms of x and obtain one or more implicit solutions. Let's leave that. Okay. Let's look at example 7. All right. Let's clear the screen. All right. Here's a relation. x squared plus y squared is equal to 25. I can't write. Okay. Now, by the way, x squared plus y squared is equal to 25. It's an equation, but what's an equation of? A circle of radius 5, isn't it? Centered at the origin. Okay? Now, that defines that circle. Okay? Now, can you explicitly solve that in terms of y and y alone? You can but it won't be a single function. It'll be two functions. The top half of the circle, bottom half of the circle. Because, guess what? It's not a function if you include them both. Fa fa fails the vertical line test. So, it's basically an implicit solution. Uh, well, that relation, they say, is an implicit solution of this differential equation. dy dx is equal to minus x over y. Okay. On the open interval, oops, open interval, messed up. Minus five to five. Okay. Guess what? That circle not defined out here, not defined over there. Only defined from minus 5 to 5. Now, it does include minus 5 and plus 5, but it's not a solution to it. You will see that in a second. Okay? I hope you will. Anyway. Okay. Now, what we have to do to do this we have to come up with dy dx. How do you get dy dx from that equation? That top equation, oh, you said separated? You could do that, but you don't have to. There is another way. Implicit differentiation. You remember that? Okay, take a derivative of x squared. This is dy dx of x squared. What is, what is that? 2x, right? Plus, now take the derivative of a y squared. And what do you get? 2y, but not just 2y, you do dy dx. Right? Because of chain rule. You don't need to do a dx dx, so dx dx is 1. You could do it, but it's 1. But here, dy dx is not necessarily 1. And then take a derivative of a 25, and what do you get? 0. Okay? Let's solve this for dy dx. What would that give us? What would you do first? Second, subtract 2x from both sides. Okay, so that's going to give us, that goes to 0. It gives us 2y dy dx is equal to minus 2x. Now what? Divide both sides by, you're trying to solve for dy dx. Yak. Solve for dy dx. So you divide by 2y both sides. Okay, these go out, and the twos go out, and guess what you get? You get that dy 
dx is equal to minus x over y. Ding, 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 ding. It works. Now, but it only works on that interval from minus 5 to 5. Now, is there any reason that we can't include why we couldn't make it a closed interval? Let's see. If x were equal to minus 5, what would y have to be equal to? In this equation, if x is equal to minus 5, that would be minus 5 squared would be 25, plus y squared would equal to 25. What would y have to be equal to? This, this is the interval on x. So you plug in minus 5 for x. That gives you 25. Plus y squared is equal to 25. What would y have to be? 25 plus y squared equals 25. What would y have to be? Zero! Right? Can y equal zero in that form? No, it can't. That's why we have to exclude minus 5 and plus 5. Do the same thing with plus 5. y can't equal zero to give you that result. But anywhere inside that, it would. That would be fine. Okay? All right. Now, you could have also done it the other way, separating them, doing each one of them separately. Uh, frankly, it's a little more work. I like to avoid that if possible. Okay? You don't have to. You could do it. You are a hard worker. That would be fine. Okay, and in your text, you'll see how they do that. Uh, implicit solution can handle the whole circle at once. Explicit solution, you have to split it into y1, which is the upper half, and y2 is the, minor, is the lower half. Uh, but then you have to exclude the endpoints, okay, which you do otherwise as well. Now, let's look now at the concept of a family of solution or families of solutions. Study of differential equations is similar to that of integral calculus when evaluating an antiderivative or an indefinite integral uh, on calculus we often use a single constant C of integration you know, some constant of integration. Analogously we'll see in chapter 2 when solving first order differential equations then we usually obtain a solution containing a single constant or parameter. Now that's the first order, okay? Uh, because one solution doesn't fit all. You have a family of solutions and that could be with some constant in there, okay? And if it's a first order differential equation, you just have one parameter, you call it a one parameter family of solutions. When solving nth order differential equation, you know, y to the, the fifth derivative of y, then you're going to have up to five constants, okay? So that would be um, uh, an n parameter uh, family of solutions, okay? And that means a single differential equation can possess an infinite number of solutions corresponding to an unlimited number of choices for those parameters. A solution of a differential equation that is free of parameters is called a particular solution. Now this is just a definition now. Uh, later we'll, we'll make more sense of it. The parameters is a, in a family of solutions such as g of x, y, c1, c2, c3, c4, and all up to cn equals zero are arbitrary up to a point. For example, and this one, excuse me, that's on, <coughs> sorry, on the board right now, um, I lost my place, okay, formally satisfies the original equation, this one here that's underlined, um,
lost my place here. There it is. Uh, however, it's understood that the relation should always make sense in the real number system. <coughs> so if uh, <coughs> so if c uh, if c is equal to negative twenty five, we cannot say that uh, x squared plus y squared is equal to negative twenty five is an implicit solution of the differential equation because it can't be. X squared is always positive, Y squared is positive, you add them together, they're positive, you can't be a negative number. So you can't just put any old number there. Okay. So let's look, they're going to have us look at some particular solutions that are actually free of parameters. It seems like we should have done some parameters first, but maybe the particulars are easier. So let me clear the screen. I may have to go get some water. Uh, and since uh, Marcus had to step out anyway, let me just pause here. He's probably coming back. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've <clears throat> okay. Uh, let me pause just a minute here. I've, we are recording again, and what I was going to do is clear the screen, and I decided I needed to clear my head. It's still not there, but it's better. So, for all real values of C, here's a one-parameter family. Y is equal to CX minus X cosine X. Okay. All right. It says that that is an explicit solution. Explicit because you separated, you got y by itself, and only x is in constants over here. But c is an arbitrary constant. Okay. Obviously, minus one is a constant too, but that's fixed. C is an arbitrary constant. Okay. It's suggesting that is a um, solution for this differential equation x y prime minus y equal x squared sine x. What do you think? I can't look at that and say, yeah, that's a solution. I can see that. Can you? Okay. Congratulations. Okay. So what are we going to have to do? Say again? I can't hear you. Okay, yeah, let's, let's, what is it? Yeah, differentiate it, okay? Take a derivative. So let's do y prime. And what will y prime be? C, that's yes in Spanish, okay? Minus, whoops, good old product rule. Minus x, okay, okay. Minus x times a negative sine x, so that'd be plus sine x, right? That's the first half. You had a minus there before. Cosine x. Okay. Watch those signs. It's so easy to screw them up and get confused with them. Okay. What you could do is go off to the side and figure out what the derivative of that is, and that would be uh, minus sine x plus cosine x. Yeah, plus cosine x. And then you put the minus in front of it, and you put plus x sine x minus cosine. So that's right. Okay, let's now plug that in. So here we have x times c plus x sine x minus cosine x, that's your y prime, minus y, which is c x minus x cosine x, that's your y, 
And the question is, is that equal to x squared sine x? Hmm. Doesn't look very promising, does it? Let's see. Distribute the x across, you get cx plus x squared sine x. Hey, that's looking better, isn't it? Minus x cosine x, right? Now distribute the minus across the other one, and you get minus cx plus x cosine x. And the question is that equal to x squared sine x. Well, here's a plus cx and a minus cx. Those add to zero. x squared sine x, that's what's on the other side. Here you have a minus x cosine x and a plus x cosine x. Yes, sir, Bob. That does equal it. Okay? For any letter number c. C equals 0, C equals 17, C equals negative 4 thirds pi. Any value of C you want to put in there, that will work. So you have an infinite number of solutions. Okay. Hopefully you can see on your thing screen there the various solutions you do have there. When c is equal to 0, it's just x cosine uh, x. And that blue line in figure 1.1.3 is that one. If you put in c equal uh, 1, say, or something greater than 0, you're going to get something like the pink or the purple lines. If you put in something less than 0, you get... Uh, something that looks like either the yellow or the green lines, okay? So. <clears throat> Let's look at the B problem then. I think we'll clear the screen. Here's a two-parameter family. Y is equal to c1 e to the x plus c2 x e to the x. Okay? And they suggest that is an explicit solution. It is explicit. Y is by itself and no y's or y primes anywhere else in the right-hand side. So explicit solution of the linear second-order equation y double prime minus 2y prime, I think we've seen this one before, plus y is equal to 0. Okay? I know, I know we did. When we came up with x e to the x, we tried that one and it worked. Let's see if this works as well. What you reckon we're going to have to do first? Take a derivative to begin with, and what does that give us? y prime is equal to C1, e to the x, that's the first step, plus say again? Okay, is, I can't hear it. Did you say C2? Say that again. Okay. Okay, when I say the derivative of this, it'll be c1 times the derivative of this, which is e to the x. So that took that term. Now we're doing plus c2 times the derivative of this thing. That's the product. Yeah, is that what you're asking? Oh, I was, I was asking for c1 times the derivative of this, and I thought it was so basic. Well, c1 is a constant. Yes. Okay, yeah. So it's just a constant times the derivative of that. And C2 is just a constant, so you get that down, now do the product rule for the rest of it. And what do you get? Hmm. 
e to the x. Okay, I got, I'll buy that. Is that all? No. Plus another c2, x e to the x. You see that? Okay. Now, we also need a y double prime. Don't we? For that equation below. So what will that be? Say again. C1 e to the x. That's like a bad penny. Can't lose it. Plus C2 e to the x. Got it. Plus C2 e to the x. Plus C2, X e to the X. Okay? Now, there is a little bit of simplification we can do here. We got two of these. So that would be C1 e to the X plus 2 C2 e to the X plus C2 X e to the X. All right, there's your Y double prime. So, we'll plug that in where we have Y double prime. C1 e to the x plus 2 C2 e to the x plus C2 x e to the x. There's your y double prime. Minus 2 times what your y prime was. C1 e to the x plus C2 e to the x plus C2 x e to the x. Okay, plus y, and y is c1 e to the x plus c2 x e to the x. Okay, and supposedly this is equal to zero. That's what we have to verify. We see if it is. Well, we got one set of distribution to do, so let's write this down. C1 e to the x plus 2 C2 e to the x plus C2 x e to the x minus 2 C1 e to the x minus 2 C2 e to the x. Gracious. Uh, minus 2C2X e to the X. I wish I had gone on and added the terms here. In fact, I think I wanted to do that. This one adds to that one, making it 2. And this one adds to this one, making it 2. I wish I didn't want to write all those again. The question is, is that equal to? to zero. Okay? And look at that. 2C1 e to the x minus 2C1 e to the x. 2C2 e to the x minus 2C2 e to the x. 2C2 x e to the x minus 2C2 x e to the x. Sure enough, they all add to be zero. So they work, and they work. And notice those constants disappear when you go back and put them in here. Okay? Which they got to. I mean, they should add out to zero just like everything else. Okay. Now, if you look at figure 1.1.4, you see Oh, man. They show seven of the double infinity solutions in the family. We won't go into what they mean by that, but uh, the solution curves in red, green, and blue are the graphs of the particular solution. Okay, red, green, and blue. Uh...
y is equal to 5x e to the x. I'm not, well, okay. In other words, C1 is equal to 0, C2 is equal to 5. Uh, y is equal to 3, E to the X. That's C1 is equal to 3, C2 is equal to 0. And Y is equal to 5, E to the X minus 2, X, E to the X. That's when C1 is 5 and C2 is 2. Okay, that's the red Um, just ha red, green, and blue lines, respectively. And then some others they just threw in there, okay? And they drew them all black so you can't tell which is which, but that's your family of curves. Looks all right on the, when you go into negative infinity, everything sort of coalesces there. But boy, when you get near zero, x equals zero, and anything to the right. Some of them are going to positive infinity, some are going to negative infinity. But that's your family of curves for various values of C1 and C2. Okay. Now, this <laughs> title of example eight said particular solutions, and none of these were particular solutions. They were parametric solutions. They were those that had one or two family uh, parameter family. So why they called example eight particular solution is beyond me. All right, top of page 10. Whoa. Is it really time? Oh, how sad. That's where we'll start next time, top of page 10. If I can get my pencil to write. Okay, we almost finished. Almost, but not quite, finished 1.1. Okay, next time we'll do it, finish 1.1 pretty easily. In the homework exercises, in uh, exercise 1.1, do any of the odds 1 through 7, do number 9, do either 11 or 13, or both. 15 or 17 or both, do 19, 19 looks like it could be a nice little bear there, okay, either 21 or 23 or both, 25 or 27 or both, whoa, those have integrals in your solution, that looks like a lot of fun, uh, 29, Um, I think you can do either 31 or 33, do 35, either 37 or 39, and hang on there, we'll get the rest of those later. The discussion problems are things you can read through and think through. They really, most of the time, don't have numerical answers. Uh, but occasionally they might. I, I haven't worked all of them just to see. Um, but also look at them to see if there's a potential paper topic there. For instance, the folia of Descartes. Well, who was Descartes? That could be a paper topic or how did he develop this folia, or what's it used for, or what's the applications of it. There could be several topics there. I just saw that and called it bolded. Uh, but that's the main reason to look at these discussion problems to see if there might be a potential paper topic there. And then when we finish 1.1, I'll assign the rest of those, not very many more, but a few, and then move on to 1.2. All right. I guess it's have a good weekend now. All right, thank you.